I've done a couple of videos about the weird history of Unix. And honestly, the early computing history just in general is really, really weird. And we'll probably look back at today and some of the things we do and think, why is that how we ran things? That's exactly how I feel about that time as well. Nobody really knew how to manage a computing system. What should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed, and many of the software controls we have today to do user access and things like this just simply didn't exist. And back during this time, there was a really weird concept known as a wheel war. Now you probably know what the Unix wheel group is. That's the administrator group. There is a different term if you're on Debian. I know you people are going to comment. And you probably know what a war is. So you can probably assume what a wheel war is, as defined by Cat B from the Stanford University, a period in larval stage during which student hackers hassle each other by attempting to log each other out of the system, delete each other's files, and otherwise wreak havoc, usually at the expense of lesser users. Now this is what larval stage means. Feel free to read it yourself. The TLDR is you're a new programmer, you've just learned how to do really cool things. You've just been like staying up for 30 plus hours doing like really cool programming things you didn't know how to do before. And now, now you want to start messing with people, so you start doing this. To understand how something like this can even happen, we need to understand how people were using computers back then. Because this idea of having like a computer in your pocket that you just walk around with, it's connected wirelessly to the internet, or just having a personal computer in your bedroom. These are really, really new concepts. Now the exact date and device is hard to say as historians can't really decide on the definition of computer, which you might think should be easy to decide on. But when you start moving away from the electrical computers into the mechanical computers, things start getting a little bit wonky. But it's generally agreed upon the first personal computer is the Simon in 1950. But most people, when you think of a personal computer, you're thinking of an actual modern style computer. And those as personal machines weren't up until maybe the 70s and 80s. Even then, most people could not afford them until way later. Now, prior to this mainstream concept of the personal computer, oftentimes a computer was something that you went to. It was at a location. It was at your work. It was at a university. It wasn't something you just had with you. And oftentimes, there was just one computer that everybody interacted with. This is referred to as a multi-seat system. Traditionally, you would have this big, powerful computer. Obviously, powerful in the context of 1970s is kind of a joke today, but powerful for the time. This was a big system, it was big money, and completely impractical to give every single student one, even if they could afford them. We're talking machines here that take up entire rooms. Even if you could, it's just not practical to give a personal one to every student. So instead, a bunch of people would all connect to the exact same machine with a terminal. Now, a terminal does not mean a terminal emulator like we see on Linux. Those emulate the physical terminals that were traditionally used. This basically looks like a monitor with a keyboard attached, and its entire purpose is connecting to one of these big machines. This provided some way to give input and then see output, but all of the complex computation was not being done on the terminal, that was being done on the big mainframe computer. This was even the case into the days of X11. Nowadays, we run the X11 clients and the X11 server on the same computer, but back then, you had these X11 terminals which were running your X11 server, and then the applications, those were running on the mainframe system. This is why the concept of X11 forwarding even exists in the first place. It wasn't built around the model of running everything on a single machine. You were going to be running X11 
across two different machines then. Even in those days of X11 terminals, you were still running a multi-seat configuration. So you would have multiple different people, all with their own X11 terminals, all running their own applications on the same computing hardware. Now this concept still can kind of be done today on modern Linux distros. The documentation is kind of wonky because nobody really needs to do this now, so nobody really maintains the documentation. But theoretically, it should still be possible. This way of doing computing works just fine if all the people interacting with the system are just standard users, have their own standard user accounts, and cannot interact with what anybody else is doing. The problem is when you start letting some of those users be admins. And when that admin is not someone outside of the system who has no conflicts of interest, they're not some, you know, external party that is there just to run the computing system, they're one of the users who are trying to get the very limited computing resources. What you may have seen happen is leadership of different research labs being given administrative access to the system to do whatever administrative things they need to do. Assuming that they could be trusted not to mess with other people, then there would be no issue. The problem is this was a zero-sum game. If you had a single computer on your campus, there is only a certain amount of times that pie chart can be cut. And every time the pie chart is cut, that is a little bit less time that you are getting. So if you could maybe, I don't know, start deleting some files, kicking people off the system from a rival lab, maybe changing the password of a rival lab so they just cannot do any work. This sounds like psychopath behavior. But it was being done. And it could get even worse if you start letting those, you know, first year students access the password. The people that, you know, haven't built up these relationships around the campus yet, they're just you know, giant assholes and want to cause chaos. They could do anything they want. If you let one of those people have the password, there is no telling how much destruction will be done. And there will be unintended consequences. There will be people who are not involved in this little squabble, who get files deleted, who get time lost, and time lost on a system like this is incredibly expensive. Now you can see a really good example of this on the old SU documentation. Why GNU SU does not support the wheel group. Let's put my camera there. Sometimes a few of the users try to hold total power over all the rest. For example, in 1984, literally 1984, a few users at the MIT AI lab decided to seize power by changing the operator password on the Twinix system and keeping it secret from everyone else. I was able to thwart this coup and give power back to the users by patching the kernel, but I wouldn't know how to do that in Unix. However, occasionally the rulers do tell someone. Under the usual SU mechanism, once someone learns the root password who sympathizes with the ordinary users, he or she can tell the rest. The wheel group feature would make this impossible and thus cement the power of the rulers. I am on the side of the masses, not that of the rulers. If you're used to supporting the bosses and sysadmins in what they do, you might find this idea strange at first. Now, I don't agree with this approach to deal with the problem, but it does highlight that a problem was there. The much better idea is to not let literal psychopaths take control of your computing system. Why are there not policies in place? outside of the computing system, so if some random student goes rogue and says, okay, well, this is my computer now. Like, why is that a thing that you would let happen? This is what I mean from what I said at the start. We did not know how to manage computing systems back then. What should and shouldn't be allowed to happen, because now what would happen is you would have an IT department outside of that user who would then be able to kick them off and say, no, what do you, you, you do? What? What do you, no, it's not your computer. That's not how this works. You're just some random student here. Go back to class and study. Along with this, we've built better software tools so we don't just have to give random people 
full-on admin access. We have tools like sudo now, where you can just have very fine grain control over what commands you're allowed to run. You might be able to install certain packages and uninstall certain packages and run certain little commands. Not every single thing that you need root access for, because you don't want some random psycho taking over the entire system by just changing passwords. And in the long run, moving away from these multi-seat configurations. Nowadays, most people have a personal computer, and the only centralized connection they have is maybe some centralized intranet or maybe some centralized storage server. It's not like everybody is running on the same computing system. There might be some central server that is doing some sort of management on those systems, but not all the computing is happening in one place. But I guess as we move to more cloud computing, maybe that problem is going to rear its head in another way. Now, it's entirely possible that other terms were used previously or just no term whatsoever to describe the phenomenon, but the earliest use of the term wheel war that I can find is from Eric S. Raymond in 1983, at which point the term wheel was already well established in Unix culture having come from a previous system, so a war over that wheel or admin access makes sense you would use the term wheel war. Now here's something neat, whilst the term has mostly decayed to time, it is still used in one particular place, that being Wikipedia's administrator guidelines. If we go down to the section on wheel warring, reinstating an admin action that has already been reversed, sometimes known as wheel warring, responses have included arbitration and desysopping even the first time. And under the reinstating a reverted action, wheel warring. When another administrator has already reversed an administrative action, there is very rarely any valid reason for the original or another administrator to reinstate the same or similar action again without clear discussion leading to a consensus decision. Wheel warring is when an administrator's action is reversed by another administrator, but rather than discussing the disagreement, administrator tools are used in a combative fashion to undo or redo the action. With very few exceptions, once an administrator action has been reverted, it should not be restored without consensus. Do not repeat a reversed administrative action when you know that another administrator opposes it. Do not continue a chain of administrative reversals without discussion. Resolve administrative disputes by discussion. Wheel warring usually results in the immediate request for arbitration. Sanctions for wheel warring have varied from reprimands and cautions to temporary blocks to sysopping, even for the first incidents. There have been several relevant arbitration cases on the subject of wheel warring. The phrase was also used historically for an administrator improperly reversing some kinds of very formal action. Wheel wars are something that in the computing space doesn't really exist in the same fashion anymore. More. But when it comes to just administrators or moderators fighting over an action being taken, that hasn't gone anywhere. Whether it be a Discord server, whether it be something like Wikipedia, there will always be people fighting over whether an action should be taken. Reverting the action, doing the action, doing other things, then messing with that other person again, and just not communicating anything. At the end of the day, this entire problem can be solved by just talking to the other people involved and not being a psycho about it. So, what do you think? If you were given administrative access on a multi-seat system, would you be a psycho about it? Would you start kicking people off the system? Or would you just be normal? I would love to know. So if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become one of... These amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, scrubs, the Libera Pay, linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and please don't start any wheel wars. We got too many wheel ones.